If you would look with me in First John <coughs> chapter three. Church, continue to lift up Deacon Freddie Wright as well as uh, Sister Pinky Boston. We are grateful for Sister Boston and her faithfulness of being here with everything she's going through. And we do understand Deacon Wright cannot right now be here, but pray for, uh, pray for them. First John chapter 3. I'll commence reading at verse number 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we are passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso, whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Man. <clears throat> you may be seated. Verse 11 says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. Now, I believe that most of us know the story of Cain and Abel. We know that Cain killed his brother Abel for no reason, simply because of the fact that Abel was righteous in his gift and his offering unto God. And God received, accepted the offering, the sacrifice of Abel. But God did not accept the sacrifice of Cain, however God would have accepted it if he would have done it in the right manner with the right heart and given the right thing but the scripture says for this is the message that ye heard from the beginning that ye, we should love one another not as Cain and just for a while a little while today I want to talk from the subject I want to talk about the spirit of Cain in the church today <clears throat> the spirit of Cain in the church today if you have truly been transformed by Jesus Christ, the evidence of your transformation should show up in the way that you treat your brother or sister. Your life, my life, ought to be a demonstration of love, patience, and compassion. Your life, my life, should be a highlight reel of love. When people see our lives, it should just be a highlight reel over and over of love. From the beginning, God's message to us has been to love one another. That's really the first message that Jesus really began to preach uh, when he said that a new commandment I give unto you, that you should love one another. But the attitude of Cain still has a way of creeping into the church into the body of Christ in the year of 2018. That attitude is really that of Cain, I'm not my brother's keeper. That's really what the attitude is, that I'm not responsible for you and you're not responsible for me, but that's really a spirit of, of an unloving person. 
we often have to be reminded over and over, Brother Wynn, that we should be putting the feelings of others ahead of our own. That's what Paul says in Philippians 2 and 3, that we should consider others better than ourselves. And we have to be reminded of that so very much because we are very selfish persons and generation where we think it's all about us. But Paul says it's not about us, but it's about others, that we should put others ahead of ourselves. But then he says also in Romans 12 and 10, to love one another with brotherly affection, really to outdo one another in showing honor. You should do your very best to show love to your fellow man, and you should, you should try to outdo someone else in showing honor and love to them. But in our text, God, he really promises those of us who really know him that the reactions and the responses of Cain will be replaced by the reactions and the responses of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the reality John confronts us with in our text. He says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Uh, Cam, you don't have to pull a gun. You don't have to pull a knife, Teresa, or anything of that nature. But, but, but you don't have to do those things in order to be a murderer. All you have to do is look the other way when God is calling for you to help someone else and you turn and look the opposite direction because you don't like that person. So you're saying, I, I don't want to help that person. At best, hatred becomes indifference, our avoidance of another person, causing separation and distance in relationships. Uh, I believe that we see it often in marriages where you will have a husband and wife and they avoid one another and they uh, try to be separate and they sleep in different rooms and all of these different things. But, 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 but often it, it is because of the fact that they don't like one another anymore. <clears throat> but Jesus said that this type of dislike and this type of anger is really the root of Murder. That's where really murder begins. Not very often does anyone go and murder someone without them having a, a dislike or hatred for that person uh, at first. So what we do, we like to look at murder as the worst thing in the world, and it's a horrible situation, no doubt about it. But then we, too often, we tolerate the roots of our, our sin of dislike, our, our anger towards someone. We, we tolerate that, and we want others to tolerate it as well. But we need to see our own selfish anger is as hideous as anything else can be, and we need to yank it out by the roots. You know, we talk so very much about the beautiful white robes that we will wear when we pass from earth to to heaven, but I believe that Jesus would be more pleased with us if our robes were, were soiled from the labor of helping other people. We, we too often, we try our best to have our long white robes on and we don't want to get our hands dirty and we don't want to help people, but, but, but really Jesus, uh, he is more pleased with us when we serve one another by washing one another's feet. Too many have the mindset of the poem, to live above with the saints I love. Oh, wouldn't that be glory? But to live below with the saints I know, that's a different story. I don't know how we think we're just going to get along with everybody up yonder, but not get along with them down here. <clears throat> uh, knowing we are loved by God, by the God that knows all about us, knowing that we're loved by him should make us more loving. And the reason I say that, Sister Butler, is because we know ourselves. We know how unlovable we actually are. So we should do our very best to love others when we think about a God in heaven that sits high and looks low and he loves us despite of us. But John is teaching us about agape love, which is supposed to be the highest expression of love, a pure, a selfless, and unconditional type of love. He's teaching us that the unconditional love that God has for us is the same love that we should try to show and express to other people. 
It's a love that goes against our carnal nature, which compels us to only love those who we think love us. But, but, but agape love, it moves past that, and it loves despite the person. But how is agape love expressed? Agape love is often expressed in very subtle but very, very effective ways. It's in our challenging moments. When we show a little extra ounce of patience toward a difficult spouse. It's in our disagreeing moments when we choose to, to speak less and to swallow our words a little bit more. It's in someone's bad day when we, uh, we run away less and try to help uh, more. It's uh, in our sacrificial moments when we open our, our, our fist and we share with others. It's in our vengeful moments when we have the power to retaliate, but we say that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And he shall repay. Amen. You cannot know agape love unless you first know how to what we talked about last week, and that's how to forgive. The two really go hand in hand. They have to go together because you cannot live in this world without getting uh, bitten by one of Satan's snakes. His snakes are everywhere. They ride the backs of the saved folks and the unsaved uh, alike. And, and, and if you return hate uh, uh, with, with uh, love, then you're doing the right thing. But if you return uh, hate with hate, you'll soon, soon be nothing more than a bitter wretch of a man or woman. You'll be miserable in this life if you expect folks to always treat you kindly and always be good to you and always show you love and, and, and you will be disappointed because that's not the world we live in. But in our text, the Apostle John, he holds up Cain and Jesus Christ for us as a, a juxtaposition, a comparison, if you will, a contrast for us to compare. Cain, he reacted with hatred to a brother who was good. Uh, Cain, uh, he, he, he treated this good brother of his, Abel, who was a good man. He, he treated him with hatred because of the fact he was good. But Jesus, he responds with love to sinners who reject God. Each expresses his feeling and action, and Cain, he even took another person's life. But I don't know about you, but when I look at Cain and I look at Christ, I, I, I really want to uh, be more like Christ. I want to respond to others like Jesus did. In James 3 and 16, it says, For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. See, Cain, he was a man who was full of jealousy. He was full of hatred. He was full of, of envy, and he was full of greed. And if that is your life, if that is what your life looks like, then I'm telling you it's going to be confusion and every evil work in your life. Because James, the half-brother of Jesus, he tells us that when those things are prevalent in our lives, then, then confusion and every evil work will be there. Is that your life today? Every day, every week, it's just a bunch of confusion, a bunch of uh, evil deeds going on, and it may very well be because of the fact that your life is full of jealousy and hatred and envy. But I would rather personally be known as one who displays the fruit of the Spirit. I don't do it so very well every single day, but I, I want to be known as one who displays the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness, and, and faith. I would rather be like Christ. But I, I, as I look at our text, I love the way that John unravels the truth of our salvation. And what I mean by that is that if you say that you're saved, you say that you're born again, John comes in and he really unravels the fact if you are saved or not. He says that God expressed his love for us through the gift of Jesus Christ, and, and we are to respond to that love by loving others. John puts it another way in, in, uh, in the fourth chapter, verse 7 and 8, when he writes, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God, and he that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. 
we cause God to grieve every time we who name the name of Christ are unloving. In fact, if we, if we learn nothing else from our text, we should learn that salvation and hatred, it does not mix. Uh, it just does not go together. I, I know we like to say, uh, you know, I don't like that person, I dislike them, and sometimes we'll say we even hate them and all that. But salvation and hatred, it just does not uh, go together in any way, shape, or form. In our text, John speaks of of four different levels of, of relationships in which you and I can choose to live. In verses 11 and 12, he, he, he talks about murder. In verses 13 through 15, he talks about hatred. Then in verses 16 and 17, he talks about indifference. And then fourthly, he talks about Christian love in action in verse 18. We need to know that love and hate, they are mutually exclusive in your Christian life. You can't have both of them. They cannot both occur at the same time. A, 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 a clear example of this is set in the outcomes of a single coin toss. You can't have heads and tails. <laughs> you can either have heads or you can have tails. But in our Christian life, we can't have love and hate. It does not go together. War and peace are mutually exclusive. They're not able to be true at the same time or exist together. As children of God, we are to behave like children of God. It's not enough to believe right, but we also must behave right. Let me say that one more time. It's not enough that we believe right. Uh -huh. But we should also behave right. We live in a day and time we don't like that word behave anymore. We think that's a, a word for children, a word for uh, babies or dogs or something. But it is a word for us as Christians. Uh, it's not just about what you say you believe, but it's also about the way that we behave, the way that we act. Being precedes doing. Being Precedes doing. Being a Christian precedes uh, doing. It, it must be based upon being, that is, who we are in Christ. Now, if you are one that you have a lot of hatred in you, then you are being, but you are being who may be your father, who is the enemy, is helping you to be. Cannot just believe, but we also have to behave in the right manner. Amen. We have to walk this thing out as Christians. John, he gives us an illustrative example of the brothers Cain and Abel in verse 12 of our text that's related to verse 11 as negative to, to positive. As he gives us this contrast, look with me in verse 12. John answers three questions about Cain. He says, not as Cain. Now, for, for, first, what, what does he say uh, first there in, in verse, number, verse number 11? He says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. <clears throat> That's the positive of verse number 11. But then he gives this contrast in verse number 12. He says, now, for those of you who are confused about what I just said, this is the Apostle John, really what he's saying. He's saying, not as Cain, not, 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 as, not as he did, not as Cain who was of that wicked one and yeah, slew his yeah. brother. Where, and wherefore slew he him? He said, why did he do it? He said, because of his own works, they were evil. See, some of you, you're here today and your works are evil, so you look, at, you look at me, and I don't even want to use me, but you look at me and you, you, you see some semblance of, let, if nothing else, I think we can agree on this one. If nothing else, from the exterior, you see a semblance of good. And then you, you want to hate me because of the good that you see 
Now, I'm not that good. Trust me, I got a whole bunch of stuff. But, 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 but you see a semblance of good and you want to sit in judgment All right. and you want to hate me is because you're of the wicked one. That's right. That's right. Now, that, that's, that's what that's the, I think I'm feeling it now. Yes, <laughs> he says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. He said, don't get it twisted now. Don't, 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 don't behave like, like him yeah. that slew his brother. And why did he slew him? Because of his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous mm -hmm. he's saying don't no don't 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 be like him first the question really becomes where did Cain come from where did where did he come from he came from the the wicked one but what did Cain do what did he do he murdered his brother and third why did Cain do it his deeds were evil. Cain's underlying jealousy and hatred for his brother led to his murder of his good brother, Abel. So what John does, he draws a conclusion in verse 13. This is where it, it comes alive for us here in 2018, where, where we look back and we see Cain killing his good brother, Abel, good man, didn't do no wrong to nobody. Didn't do anything wrong to anybody, but he got killed by his evil brother, <clears throat> Cain. So now we see in 2018 in verse 13, John draws this conclusion and he says, stop being surprised that the world, people like Cain hate you. Y'all not getting it. This is what bothers you every single time, every day. You know, why, why do they treat me like that? Why are people that way with me? I haven't done no, no wrong to nobody. I haven't done anything. I try to be kind and loving and nice to folks, and then they treat me like this. The Apostle John is just saying, brother, sister, don't be surprised. He's saying, just go back and look at Cain. Killing his good brother Abel for nothing because his brother brought the right thing to God. So he's saying, stop being surprised that the world, people like Cain, hates you. The world hates Christians for the same reason. I'm talking about truly born again, baptized believers is walking this thing out. When you're trying to walk this thing out, folks, the world is going to hate you because... When they see you doing the right thing and they look at their life yeah. in contrast, they, yeah. they, they, they juxtapose their life to your life. Yeah. Get your eyes off of me. <laughs> <laughs> you look to Jesus, the author and finisher yeah. of your faith. Right. But, but they look at you and they look at you trying to walk this thing out and they get angry, they get upset. And they hate That's you right. like right. Cain hated yeah. Abel. That's right. Abel's righteousness was the fruit of his obedience to the Lord. And this revealed Cain's disobedience and unrighteousness yeah. for what it was in reality. So by Cain doing the right thing, it showed his fruit of obedience unto the Lord. But then it also showed Cain's disobedience to the Lord. See, sometimes folks, they never know how messed up they are until they see you walk it out. This present tense verb, <clears throat> hate, it indicates a state of hostility. Some people are just hostile. They're just hostile people. Note, note with me the, the shift uh, from children to brothers in verse 14 since john is dealing with the topic of brotherly love and cain and abel uh they were they were brothers uh, look look there uh with me he says verse 13 he says marvel not 
my brethren, our children, if the world hates you. And then he says in verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Then he says in the B clause of verse 14, he that loveth not his brother abide in death. John says we have come to know through experience that we have permanently passed from spiritual death to spiritual life there in verse 14 because we love the brethren. The experience he refers to is our love for fellow believers, fellow, fellow Christians. John, he views life and death as as opposite spiritual domains, to pass from death to life is to experience the permanent change from a state of lostness to a state of being saved. But how is it that one who hates his brother is a murderer? That, I'm sure somebody's asking that question, but Jesus, he answered the question in Matthew 5, verse 21 and following. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. You all, hatred is an intense emotional feeling. And often it's the desire to, uh, to get rid of that person. Hate is the first step to murder. As I said a moment ago, very rarely do people just go murder someone. It kind of starts off <clears throat> with hate. And John, he continues to use this, this logic that hate is attitudinally no different than murder. That's just what he's saying. Hey, it's really no different than murder. But the question is not so much what did you do? What did you want to do? What was really in your heart? And I'm, I'm preaching to you from a spiritual standpoint of what, of what Jesus, what really he says to us and how he, he looks at us. He does not look at us from the exterior, Sister Eddie May, like we like to look from the exterior. That's why I said, you know, a semblance, which you might look and see a semblance of good. But Jesus knows my heart, Brother Warner. And he knows you all's heart as well. And what he's doing today, the spirit of the living God is really, he's searching our heart. He's challenging our heart. He's moving deeper within our spirit for us to search ourselves and know where we're coming up short. Allow me to to uh, put this one in kind of for free. Our love should not be limited to just believers according to John. Not just believers. <clears throat> I know sometimes we like to, to be kind and loving to, to Christians, but maybe not other folks that challenge us. But notice he tells us not to be surprised. What if the world hates us and then immediately proceeds in verse 14 to say, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Amen. The emphatic use of we in the Greek text, it contrasts the way Christians love and the way that non-Christians love. But there's a no emphatic contrast. If Christians love their own little group in the same way the world loves them. Matter of fact, the word uh, brother in the B clause of verse 14 is added in most translations. In the original Greek manuscript, you don't even find the word brother or brothers or, or anything of that nature. It really reads, uh, he that loveth not abideth in death. So he's really not saying, I mean, we've just kind of added that he's really not saying that he that, that loveth uh, not the brothers abideth in death. What he's saying that he that loveth not abideth in death. See, because I don't understand how you can just love a Christian, but then you don't love also, uh, Brother Garland, an, an, a, a non-Christian. I don't know how we don't, we can't do that. If we love a Christian, we're going to love the non-Christian. We cannot put a distinction there. Uh, now, I know the scripture says that let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, but it does not tell us to love the Christians and love the non-Christians. Somebody may be saying, you put your left hand over the non, let me say it, the non-Christians and the Christians. He didn't say that we're to have a distinction there. 
But the duty of love, it is absolute and has a wider application uh, than just Christians. In the passage, John, he actually demands that our love be more inclusive than the love of the world, which loves only its own. That's why, Christian, that's why many of these young folks, that they do go and get in gangs and things of that nature because the gang shows them some type of love. I don't know that it's real love. I'm not telling you that, but it looks like love to that young person, and they don't get the love that they're looking for maybe in their home or with their family, so they go somewhere else and they get love there. And then they become a part of, of that. But, 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 but Jesus, he says in Matthew 5, verse 43 and following, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles. That's the, that's the unbelievers do the same. But church, love must be demonstrated in your Christian life and my Christian life, according to verses 16 through 18 of 1 John 3. We have known this love, all of us as, as Christians, in its essence and meaning because we are direct recipients of this love. This love, the knowledge of this love, is based on a historical event of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He laid down his life for us. So what, what, what John says uh, here in 1 John 3, uh, 16, he says, hereby perceive we the love of God. He said, here is the way we know the love of God. What is he talking to us about? He's talking to us about loving our brothers, our sisters, and even those outside of the faith. And he says in verse 16, hereby perceive we the love of God. This is how we know it. This is how we see it. Because he laid down his life for us, and we are to lay down our lives for the brethren. won't even lay down our jacket for somebody to walk across <coughs> some water. We, we, won't, we won't lay down our pride of holding on to some uh, uh, unforgiveness. We won't even lay down that. But look at what the scripture says. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How, how do you get around that? I, I'm, I, how do you get around that? I, I'm not being funny. I'm not, I'm not fussing at you. I'm just asking, how do you get around verse 16? How? When you say, you know, someone has upset you, you know, back in 1985, they did this to you. Let me bring it closer to home. Three years ago, he did this, she did that. I mean, I understand. But, but verse 16 says, hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So John, the apostle John, he has written this under the unction of the Holy Spirit. So I'm just simply asking you, how do you get around verse 16? Take a swig of water and make you think about it. <laughs> Jesus' death on the cross was a voluntary death. He laid down his life as a substitutionary death for us. The epitome of love it is seen on the, on the cross. That's what it is seen on the cross. And only in the cross can we understand the love of God. So on the basis of Jesus' death for, for us, John, he states emphatically that we are under moral 
obligation, if necessary, to lay down our lives for others. That's, that's what he's saying. He's saying we are under moral obligation to lay down our lives if necessary for, for others. Hereby, we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So then John, what he does is he moves uh, to practicalities and details of loving in verse 17. Look with me where he shifts from the plural brethren to the singular brother to individualize our duty to love in specific circumstances. Because when we say we just love folks, I love everybody. But the question is not necessarily if you love everybody. The question is, do you love the person seated next to you? That's the question, because if you love the person seated next to you, the person in front of you, the person behind you, the person that uh, when you drive down the street, at, you know, when you love all of those people, then you love everybody. <clears throat> so saying we, we love everybody in general may become an excuse for us to love nobody in particular. But what he does, he paints his vivid pi picture in verse 17. But whosoever has the world's goods and seeth his brothers have, have need, his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? First, he, he speaks of the world's goods, and he doesn't describe someone who is rich in material goods. That's not what he's describing. He's simply describing an average, ordinary person who has the basics like you have of livelihood at his disposal and you could help somebody. You could help somebody. You know, I, I was going to say, I didn't think I had any money in my pocket and, and well, I actually, but I have a little, a little change. I got, I got a quarter. At least I got, I got a quarter right here. I, I could help somebody. With this, I, I know we like to say, well, I, I can't afford to do it. I can't do it. But, but, but really what John is t telling us is that we can do it. If, if you, you shut up your bowels of compassion, seeing your brother in need, uh, uh, what he's really saying is that what you're doing is you're giving a casual glance at your sister over there that is in need. You're just giving a, a casual glance, and, and then you're moving on and saying, I'm not going to do anything. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. But we got to learn to open our hearts up. We got to learn to open our hearts up. But here, let me, let, me, uh, let me try to close this on out. Look with me, verse number 18. It says, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Deed and we need to do. Let's not just talk about it, but let's also be about it. Let, let, let our words have some action behind them. Just like I said to you today, you know, men should pray about everything and then go vote. <clears throat> let it be some, some action behind it. In closing, it would really be like uh, a modern day Good Samaritan looking at, um, looking at the, the person that has fallen among thieves and them actually doing what the Good Samaritan did. He got down off his high horse and he went and he helped the person. But you have the priest and the, the Levite, it would be like them looking down at this beaten up man, laying there on the road and saying, you need help, but I don't need you. And that's how we treat people often. If we think that we need them, we might help them. But really, we need to help those that even they cannot ever return anything our way. <clears throat> we need to get busy loving other people. Because, again, salvation and hatred, it just does not mix. There's really like oil and water. You cannot love Jesus and hate your brother. You need to make sure that that you put up or you shut up. I know that's a strong choice of, of words, but, but it's been around ever since Mark Twain introduced it in 1889. Put up or shut up. Whatever you talk about, you ought to be about it. Don't, don't, 
Don't tell me you're a Christian. Show me that you're a Christian. And you may be saying, well, preacher, I, I really don't care if you know or not. Well, the unbeliever is saying to you, don't tell me you're a Christian. Show me you're a Christian. And Jesus, he certainly, he showed that he was one sent by God. When he marched up Golgotha's hill, when he marched up with a, a rugged cross on his back, after they had plucked out his beard, <clears throat> after they had put a crown of thorns over his head, after they had pierced him in the side, after they nailed nails in his hands and spikes in his feet, he said, Father, Father, he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He showed what he was made of when he hung on that cross. And we show what we're made of every single day. When we react or we respond. When we want to cuss someone out because they were not so very kind to us. And the Holy Ghost just convicted me of something from yesterday. But you need to let the spirit of the living God speak to you. And say to you, what area of your life do you need to change? What area of your life needs to be rearranged? What area of your life is the spirit of, of Cain all in your mind, all in your heart? You need to ask God to rebuke and reject and remove the spirit of Cain from your life and ask that he replace it with the spirit of Jesus Christ that, that abides within us if you are a Christian you need to act like you're a Christian this is not about you need to act like as you don't need to, I'm not talking today about you don't need to go here go to the gambling shack go to the club and that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about if you are a Christian you need to act like you're a Christian let me tell you what Christians do. Christians will smile and say hello. They will just show just a spirit. They will display a spirit of love. I'm not talking about grimacing and, you know, hello. I'm, not, I'm just saying a spirit of love. Christians. Christians are patient people. They're loving people. They're harmonious people. They are peaceful people. And you don't rile Christians up too quickly. Christians. Amen. So John is simply saying, he has simply said, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. Not like that. With the spirit of Christ, not the spirit of Cain. The spirit of Cain needs to remove itself from the Ebenezer Baptist Church. <clears throat> and we invite the spirit of Christ into the Ebenezer Baptist Church. The spirit of Christ is loving, is patient, is kind. It knows how to smile even when you have done something against it. When a person messes up, unintentionally or intentionally, the spirit of Christ is forgiving. The spirit of Christ. I don't want to live my life with the spirit of Cain. I want to live the rest of my life. I don't know how long I have, but I just want to live it with the spirit of Christ. I want to be better. I'm not talking about you. I want to be better. I would hope you want to be better, but I want to be better. 
I want to be more loving. I want to be more kind. I want to be more patient. 